Today we're going to look at a simple equation that has a surprisingly interesting solution. So in particular, we're going to explore this equation z to the n equals z plus 1 to the n. And you might say, well, that doesn't seem to have solutions much of the time. In fact, let's observe that if n is odd and we're considering real values of z, then that means that we have z equals z plus 1. Because if n is odd, we can simply take the nth root of both sides. But notice that z equals z plus 1 pretty clearly has no solution because there's no number that is equal to 1 more than itself. That doesn't make any sense. That's equivalent to saying that 1 is equal to 0. Now, let's observe that it gets a little bit more interesting if we have n even and then also z is a real number. Because let's observe in that case, we'll have z equals plus or minus z plus 1. That's because if n is an even number, if we take the nth root, we pick up two solutions. Just for example, think about the equation z squared equals 4. Well, if z squared equals 4, then z is plus or minus 2. Well, that's what's happening right here. We're taking an even root and we pick up a plus or a minus. But now let's observe that that's going to split into a case where there's no solution and then there it will be a case where there's a, there is a solution. So let's see, if we get z equals z plus 1, that would be one case, the plus case if you will. Well, that pretty clearly has no solution because that's the equation that's right above. But if we have z equals minus z minus 1, let's observe that Matt, that means that z equals minus half. We in fact do have a solution. Okay, so well, this equation doesn't seem super interesting yet. If n is odd, there's no solution. But if n is even, there is this single solution minus half. That's not super interesting. But what uh, does make this more interesting is to consider solutions over the complex numbers. So let's let n be any natural number. We'll later see that we really just need natural numbers bigger than or equal to 2. And let's say that we are now solving this over the complex numbers. So now I'm going to do another step before I get to my solution, and that is I'm going to divide both sides by z plus 1. So notice that our e equation is equivalent to z over z plus 1 to the nth power equals 1. But now what I'm going to do is write 1 as e to the 2 times pi times i times k. And this is going to be where k ranges from 0 to n minus 1. And you might be a little bit worried about this, but this is in fact equal to 1. And that's because we can write e to the 2 pi i times k as cosine of 2 times pi times k plus i times sine of 2 pi k. But because cosine and sine are 2 pi periodic, that means that cosine of 2 pi k is 1 and sine of 2 pi k is 0. So this is in fact 1 plus 0 times i. And of course, this yellow arrow here is just Euler's famous formula for the complex exponential. So now what I'll do is I'll take the nth root of both sides of this equation. And let's observe that that's going to give me z over z plus 1 equals e to the 2 pi i times k over n. And here we still have k between 0 and n minus 1. So observe that now we've got n solutions to our equation because we've got a solution for every value of k right there. But now I'm going to actually introduce a little bit of notation just to simplify our lives here. And that is I'm going to write e to the 2 pi k over n as omega sub n to the kth power. And I'd like to observe the following. And that is that we have omega sub n to the kth power is in fact equal to cosine of 2 pi k over n 
plus i times the sine of 2 pi k over n. And that's again by Euler's formula, just applied to this new exponent. But now if I look at this equation that we've just created, this z over z plus one equals omega sub n to the kth power, I've got something that I can get my hands on to solve for z. So let's get to it. So I'm gonna cross multiply, that's gonna leave me with z equals omega sub n to the kth times z plus omega sub n to the k. But now I can move everything with a z to one side of the equation and everything without a z to the other side of the equation, just like I'm in a very basic algebra class. So that's gonna leave me with z minus omega sub n to the k times z equals omega sub n to the k. But now I can factor a z out of that left-hand side, and that's gonna leave me with z times the quantity one minus omega sub n to the k equals omega sub n to the k. And now I can divide both sides by this one minus omega sub n to the k, leaving me with z equals omega sub n to the k over one minus omega sub n to the k. And you might say, well, that's our solution. But in fact, we can simplify this uh, quite a bit to make it look a lot nicer. And let's also observe that this last step that we did, this division by one minus omega sub n to the k is only possible in the case when k is not equal to zero. Because if k is equal to zero, well, what we just did here is we divided by zero. And in fact, if k is equal to zero in this equation right here, that's equivalent to saying that zero is equal to one, which clearly doesn't make any sense. That means our solutions up there were not valid for all values of k between zero and n minus one. They were in fact only valid for values of k between one and n minus one. So let's just edit that up there. But now everything is okay. And this first line, now that we've edited it after this exploration is true for all values of k right there. It does lead to a solution in all of those cases. Now we might be satisfied with this version of our n minus one solutions, but I think we can do a bit better. I think we can simplify this to make it look pretty nice. And so we'll do that by exploring this denominator right here. So here, let's extract this denominator and see what it looks like. And we'll use Euler's formula down here to do that. So I guess it's up here. So this is gonna be one minus the cosine of two times pi times k over n, and then minus i times the sine of two pi k over n. But now let's look at the complex conjugate of that as well, because notice that if we multiply the numerator and the denominator here by the complex conjugate of the denominator, then our denominator will simply be a real number. And we've got something that's in kind of a more standard form of a complex number. Okay, so let's say that this yellow arrow here is taking the complex conjugate. Recall that what we do to take the complex conjugate is to leave the real part alone and change the sign on the imaginary part. So this is gonna leave us with one minus cosine of two pi k over n and then plus i times the sine of two pi k over n. Okay, good. But now I'd like to use the fact that the cosine is an even function and the sine is an odd function. And that allows me to put a minus sign in here in the argument of cosine without doing anything to the outside because it's an even function, it gobbles up that minus. And then I can put a minus in here with the sine function if I change this plus to a minus. But now I'd like to observe that what we have down here can be rewritten as one minus omega sub n to the minus k. Again, using our Euler's formula. But that tells me what the complex conjugate of that denominator looks like in kind of a nice way, a way that makes it simple to multiply out. 
And so let's do that. Let's take this expression that we have for our solutions and multiply the numerator and the denominator by that complex conjugate of the denominator. So now we'll have one minus omega sub n to the k times one minus omega sub n to the minus k in the denominator. And then in the numerator, we'll have omega sub n to the k times one minus omega sub n to the minus k. Okay, so now let's multiply that out. So let's observe that in the numerator, we'll have omega sub n to the k minus one. And we have that because this term right here, this omega sub n to the k, and this omega sub n to the minus k are multiplicative inverses of each other. And now we're gonna see that sort of simplification occur again when we multiply out the denominator. So notice I've got one times one, which is one, but then I've got this omega sub n to the k times omega sub n to the minus k, that's also one. And so in the end, I'll have one plus one, I'll have two. And so that's from my first and last terms multiplying into each other. Notice the minus signs cancel. And then we'll have minus the sum of these other terms. That's what we get from the cross terms, if you will. So we'll have omega sub n to the k plus omega sub n to the minus k. So that's what we get from multiplying out that numerator. Sorry, that denominator. Okay, so now let's bring this expression to the top and continue simplifying it. Okay, so this is where we left off on the last board, and let's observe or let's recall that this was true for all values of k between 1 and n minus 1. We had to cut out that value of k that was equal to 0 because that didn't give us any solution at all. And that value of k uh, where it's equal to zero is like kind of in parallel to the no solution behavior that we see right here for the n equals odd case and then up here for the n equals even case. Okay, so now I'd like to continue simplifying this a little bit. So I'm gonna observe right here that omega sub n to the k is cosine two pi k over n plus i sine two pi k over n. And then just for good measure, let's put omega sub n to the minus k as well. So that's gonna be cosine two pi k over n minus i sine two pi k over n. Good, and here we're just kind of freely using the fact that cosine is even and sine is odd to simplify ourselves. Okay, so what does that allow us to do right here? So let's observe that now we can write the numerator as cosine 2 pi k over n minus 1 plus i times the sine of 2 pi k over n. So that's our numerator at the moment. And then, well, what's our denominator? So notice if I add these two objects right here, this omega sub n to the k and this omega sub n to the minus k, the imaginary parts cancel, and I pick up two times this cosine term. So that means my denominator is two minus two times the cosine of two pi k over n. Okay, so that's where we are at the moment. But now I'm gonna split this into real and imaginary parts, but let's observe that my real part is simply minus one half. And I think that's pretty clear. Here we've, here we've got a cosine minus one, and here we have a two minus two times cosine. If we factor a two out and then maybe change the sign in the numerator by factoring a minus one out, then those uh, cosine type terms cancel. Okay, so anyway, that's our real part minus half. And then we'll have plus i over two. I'm gonna factor a two out. And then we'll have the sine of two pi k over n all over one minus cosine of two pi k over n. And now this is looking quite a bit nicer already. Notice that the real part is always minus half, which I think is pretty interesting. But let's see if we can simplify that imaginary part at all. And our path towards that simplification will be using some trig identities. So first off, we'll use a double angle formula in the numerator for the sine function. And that'll allow us to write this sine of two pi k over n as two times the sine of 
pi times k over n times the cosine of pi times k over n. Okay, so anyway, that's how we're rewriting that numerator. And then we can similarly use a double angle formula in the denominator as well on this cosine term. It'll just interact with that one that's out front to simplify it a little bit. And what we'll end up with here is two times the sine squared of pi times k over n. So like I said, that's just from using some double angle formulas. So now what I'd like to observe is some stuff cancels. Notice that the twos will most definitely cancel. And then this sign right here will cancel our exponent on the sign here down from a two to a one. And so that's gonna leave us with the following expression. So we'll have minus half plus i over two, and then we'll have cosine of pi k over n over sine of pi k over n. But of course, cosine over sine is the cotangent. So we have the cotangent of pi k over n. Then let's just bring this z down right here and put a nice box around it to show that we have our solutions. And of course, like we said before, those solutions are valid for values of k between one and n minus one. Now they're not valid if k is equal to zero or actually any multiple of n, and it's actually valid for everything else as well. You just don't get new solutions. The complete set of unique solutions occur when k is between one and n minus one. And that's a good place to stop.